So welcome to a video on oversteer recovery, which you can also think of as how not to write off your car. Because out of all the incidents I've seen at racetracks which are single vehicle, the vast majority involve oversteer recovery or lack of it. Now in this video I'm going to explain exactly what oversteer is from a car dynamics perspective and how to recover uh, from oversteer issues and work through that with a number of examples. So let's talk about what oversteer actually is. Here we've got a green arc which is the path we'd like the car to take and here we've got a black arc which is the path the car is actually taking. Now to explain that we need to get into the circles of traction so I'm just going to blow the car up and I'm going to put four circles of traction at each of the wheels there. Now if you're not familiar with the circles of traction or traction circles I do have another video on that so please watch that and then one also going through what understeer is and how to recover from that. Understeer is not as sexy as oversteer but it will definitely damage your car and ruin your day just as effectively as oversteer. Anyway, we'll now delete the car just to make that diagram a bit clearer. And basically what's happening is that with oversteer, we've got, we're exceeding the grip limit at the rear, but not at the front. And what that does, that means the car is yawing, which means imagine that you've got a pole going through the center of the car and it's rotating around the axis. The other axis is there are pitch and roll. Now unchecked, that yaw will generally continue and it will get out of control which leads to a ruined day and that's what I'm trying to avoid in this video. So there's four phases to oversteer recovery. The first one is the skid where the back end of the car steps out which might be just a little bit or it might be a lot. Either which way as soon as it does you have to put in a correction which is two things. One steering where you want to go and obviously looking where you want to go but then also doing the necessary with the pedals as well which is often leaving them alone or in the case um, of where you braked too much reducing the braking if you've accelerated too much reducing that or potentially if you've got a front wheel drive car you can use a bit of acceleration where required to bring it out so you put your you put your corrections in there then once you've done the correction and arrested that yawing movement the vehicle will snap back into line and that is where a lot of people start to lose it because they haven't used the right steering wheel technique and they've got what we term spaghetti arms that, and the steering wheels all crossed up and they can't get it unwound long quick enough um, and also they're not looking where they're going the vision is not it's not quite right then when you've done all of that you've got to re-establish and think okay where is the car now where should it be because often you you use a fair bit of road in in that recovery. Now whilst you're doing all of this you have to be looking where you're going this is absolutely fundamental um, it is an essential skill and that may not be where the car is traveling. You also need to have those steering wheels pointed where you need to go at all times again that is a fundamental skill you have to get right and if you're not sure which steering wheel technique to use I do have a video on that how to steer. And then finally, um, uh, at also at the same time of all of this, fix the feet. So if you have accelerated too much, you get into oversteer, you reduce that uh, throttle. If you braked too much, you reduce the braking. Front wheel drive again, you, you can just usually accelerate a little bit if everything else is right, and that will help pull you straight there. Now, when you fix the feet, it's not really a snapping off because that can actually destabilize the car. It's just enough to bring that grip demand back within the grip limit. So here's power on oversteer, which is oversteer caused by an excess of power. You only get this in rear and all-wheel drive vehicles, um, not in front-wheel drive vehicles. That just pulls, pulls you straight. So we've got the traction circles here. The ones at the back are larger than the ones at the front because we are accelerating. The amount of grip required for turning is pretty much the same front and rear. That's the yellow there. But the rear drive um, is at the back, and that's this green arrow here. We're demanding a lot of acceleration grip, and you can see that that's just over overwhelmed the grip availability the grip demand is all the way up here so how do we deal with that well pretty straightforward we can simply um, reduce the power and for that what happens is that because we are no longer accelerating we actually reduce the size of the traction circle just a little bit there but that's okay because we're massively reducing the traction demand at the back and then that brings us back inside the traction limit and therefore no more oversteer now if you reduce power to fix oversteer, you might not want to snap it off because that tends to destabilize the car. Hopefully if you're driving correctly, you won't need to make big throttle adjustments because you'll just be dancing on that edge of traction as opposed to jumping all the way over it. Now here's another way we can fix power on oversteer. So here, again, we're going around a corner um, and we're accelerating a bit, but what we're gonna do instead is we're going to increase the turn radius. 
we are just going to reduce the amount of turning force required and you can see that allows us to maintain the amount of acceleration we have and yet and still at the same time bring that traction demand back within the traction limits. So to fix power on oversteer you can either reduce the power or increase the turning radius or a combination of both. Now in this clip I'm on a very wet uphill, it's a straight, I'm in third gear in a Toyota 86 and I'm not turning at all. Now that's represented here, I've got larger circles um, at the back than the front, the reason for that is because A I'm accelerating, B it's uphill, both of them give me a weight shift to the back and therefore increase the available grip at the back compared to the front. Now I'm accelerating pretty close to the limit as evidenced by these green arrows here reaching to the edge of the track circle. So what you're going to see in this clip is that the back end starts to break away and the reason it breaks away is not because I've added more power because I'm already at full power, it is because the traction circles here suddenly get smaller. Why is that? Because I have just driven over some particularly slippery bit of, um, of tarmac and that means that all of a sudden my traction demand has well exceeded the available traction and because it's a rear wheel drive car it starts to step out and I need to make a correction. So I've corrected the steering wheel but also what I do I've got to get that traction demand back within the traction limit and the way to do that is of course to reduce the power. So I come off the power which then massively reduces my traction demand and everything's happy again. Now you can also get oversteer when you're braking as well and this is something you can actually do in a front wheel drive car, I've done that um, quite a bit and you can also do it particularly in mid-engine cars when you're coming into a corner, sometimes called lift off oversteer as well. So the way that works is this, so we've got our car going around a corner and you can see that here that the front traction circles are relatively large because we are braking or we're lifting off the accelerator either which way we've got a weight shift to the front um, and we are demanding demanding quite a lot of turning force and the traction circles in the back are quite small because we've got, got that uh, weight shift to the front there. So how do we fix that if we're getting oversteer? And by the way this is a desirable f type of oversteer if you're going to drive fast because then you can actually use that to rotate the car into a corner as long as you don't overdo it to the point where you've got to put lots of opposite lock on. It's, it's actually quite a fun thing to do and quite effective for going fast. Trail braking is, is, is related to this. Okay so what we can do here is we increase the radius, turn radius and also reduce the brakes and that has a couple of effects. So by reducing the brakes we're actually slightly increasing the size of the traction circle at the back so that means that we are increasing the, uh, the grip levels which is all to the good because we've exceeded them um, at the back and by reducing braking we're actually also reducing the grip demand so we've got this double effect here by reducing braking we're increasing the available grip and reducing the uh, traction demand and that hopefully should be enough to bring the traction demand back within the available traction limit. Now there's two clips here, both taken from in-car footage from my, from my race car. One is where we have an oversteer situation which goes wrong, the other where we have an oversteer situation which is really well handled. And both cars are identical to mine which is a Nissan N14 um, race car. So it's actually exactly the same sort of make and model of car in both of them which is, which is pretty handy. So you could argue this is where the problems start to begin but I'd say it's probably started a bit further back because what's happening here is that the car is not pointed exactly down the straight um, and it should be because that, that's the quickest way there, it's kind of pointed a little bit in, it's got a little bit out of, out of control there and I think the reason for that is normally because people haven't looked far enough ahead. Again I come back to that point there, if you're where I am at the moment and you realise you're going to run a little bit wide then you just have to back 
of just a fraction on the throttle and that will just tighten your, your curve a little bit and then you can get back on and you can kick yourself for losing that you know tenth of a second four tenths whatever it's going to be by the time you get down the end of the straight but if you don't do that because you're not paying attention then you get to here and then you realize oh, i'm running out of road and that's where you make those big jerky um, movements and that doesn't end well as you can see so what's happening here is that the car needs to be going that direction as in the green it's actually pointing that direction as in the black and that's setting up that yawing moment on the back okay. now the car is sort of coming up towards the center of the track so instantly we know there's a problem there because there's just no way you should be that far into the right hand side of the track because the quickest line is right out there on the outside because that's where you exit this turn and the next turn is a sharp um, right hander and that yawing movement is really really starting to work now um, at this point however the steering wheels are pointed where we need to go which is ideal however that is only temporary Alright, now we have a problem here because that yawing moment, the car is now in the middle of the track and you can, and that's, it should be all the way out to the left, but look at the steering wheels, this is the point, this is why you know things are not going to end well. The steering wheels are not pointed straight down the track, they should be pointed in this direction of green, they're actually pointed that way. So where's the car going to go? It's going to go where the steering wheels are pointed. Now, from a um, traction circle perspective, um, we've got fairly much even traction because I don't think the car is really being accelerated or braked. If it was braked, that would be a problem. Um, but we are exceeding the grip level on the rear of the tyres quite significantly, which is why we've got that yawing moment. Now, the worst possible thing to do here would be to brake because that would just um, increase the traction demand on the rear tyres even more than what it is at the moment. Uh, what would actually work in a front wheel drive car would be to accelerate, then we'd get the, the front would start to pull straight and you'd get a slight weight shift to the rear, but probably not top of mind um, for this driver at the moment. Okay, now you can see here's the problem because the steering wheel hasn't been turned. The steering wheel is still sort of pointing pretty much straight ahead there and the car has yawed even further and it is now heading off the track. And look at this, the car has now yawed almost 90 degrees off the track. The steering wheel is still pointing straight off the track there and that's where the car should be going, that's where the car is actually going and it's all to do with the steering wheel movement and where those steering wheels are pointed. actually a similar situation to the previous one we've got a car which is massively yawed and the front of the car is not pointing down the track but the big difference is look at those steering wheels those steering wheels are pointed exactly where the car needs to go which is straight down the track now also notice there's no brake light and it, the reason there's no brake light is because that driver knows if they were to apply the brakes, they would send a traction demand for, for the rear wheels way beyond what it is at the moment. And if we look at the traction circles, again, fairly equal front and rear, we massively exceeding the traction limit on the rear wheels. Add the brakes to that, you're just going to make the situation worse. You'll, you'll, you'll surely, surely spin. Now, I don't know why this car got into this oversteer thing. I don't think it's anything to do with, with, with the driver. Um, had a nice smooth line there. But that just kind of goes to show you can be driving along doing everything right and all of a sudden um, there's oversteer. Maybe there could have been an unseen bit of oil on the track, I don't know. But um, it's a really good example of what to do. Okay, now this is the snapback. This is the point at which most people lose it. Even if they manage to get the initial catch, the, the yawing movement here has swung the car back beyond straight. So you can see that if the car was dead straight, it'd probably be another sort of, I don't know, 10, 15 degrees yawed round arm um, to the right. It's not there. But here's the thing. Look at those steering wheels. Those steering wheels are still pointed down the straight exactly where the car needs to go. And that is why this car is being successfully recovered.
So here's the clip in slow mode. There's the initial skid. The driver's already reacting and starting to keep those steering wheels pointed exactly where they need to go. Now the correction has come through. The car's going to snap back, but he's ready for that, not applying the brakes, just keeping those steering wheels pointed, and that's the key to a successful recovery. So in this clip, which I borrowed from Automobile Channel, we're going to see a Porsche come around YouTube corner at the Nürburgring, and you're going to see the car get into an oversteer situation, um, exaggerated by the fact it's going to be braking there, but the driver has the sense to slam the brakes on and the car starts to just slide down the centre of the track. No harm done, but take a look, because what happens is the driver lets off the brakes and rolls into the barrier, and that's why you need to keep the brakes on all the time until you have finally stopped. Now this short clip is a Toyota 86 at Haunted Hills. The driver loses it on um, a hairpin, but has the sense to slash the brakes on, keep them on, and that's what saves them from going into the wall. So these diagrams show how important locking the brakes is when you lose it. So this car's gonna come around the corner, we're gonna skid here, we're gonna go wildly side to side, get a snap back, not control it, and the car goes into the barrier, bang. That's pretty much what we saw with that yellow pulsar. And if you're wondering why at racetracks people skid here and end up crashing 100 meters down the road into the side, well, that's your explanation. Now here's the right way to correct it when um, you actually lose it. And that is we go around here, we're gonna make a skid, we're not gonna be able to correct it properly, but at this point here, we lock the brakes and the car just basically skids down the uh, length of the track fairly harmlessly, just like that Porsche did at the Nürburgring, except of course we're not going to let off the brakes at the last minute and then roll into the barriers. So here's a quote from Jim Mercott who apparently said, when you lose it, the steering wheel is only used as a brace so you can brake harder. And that's the point at which you've gone, yeah, I've got to give up here. Now this beautiful 911 was lent to me by a friend for a wet skid pan bit of fun. Um, I'm showing the clip because it demonstrates the importance of just keeping the front wheels pointed where the car needs to go, irrespective of what is happening to the back end. Now one of the most critical skills in oversteer recovery is steering. You've got to be able to really quickly and really accurately get that steering wheel from lock to lock and back to centre again. You're not going to do that unless you learn the right steering wheel technique, so check out my other video. Now here I'm driving in 86 again, and this is the same racetrack, consecutive laps. On the first lap, I managed to do a successful oversteer recovery, and on the second lap, I don't. And it's interesting to contrast the two. So at this point, I've done everything right. I have turned the steering wheel quickly, even before the car's barely beginning to rotate. And I've got the steering wheels pointed where they need to go. And at the moment, the car is still traveling where it needs to go. So, so far, so good. Now, this is the point where I don't react as quickly as I should. There's two things. First of all, I should have turned that steering wheel quicker. Secondly, I should have turned it more. And at the moment, you can see that the car is kind of pointing where it needs to go, but not quite. It should be another few degrees out, out to the left there. And we've got a significant yawing moment on. So at this point I've lost it, and the reason I've lost it is because I wasn't quick enough with the steering lock and I didn't wind enough on. So notice where I'm looking though, I'm still looking down the straight because that is where I want the car to go. And because I know I've lost it, I've applied the brakes hard and I've also continued to wind on that steering lock. And because of that, that means I don't crash into the wall.
So this is the same corner at a racetrack, it's turned four at Wakefield. We've got a Toyota 86 here being driven by um, a relatively inexperienced driver and I'm in an Hyundai i30N. Now that's rear wheel drive and front wheel drive respectively but that doesn't make any difference because we're not applying power in this oversteer situation. So what we're going to see here is the difference winding on steering lock quickly makes as opposed to not. So this is the point at which both cars are just beginning to rotate or over rotate under understeer and here's the difference. The 86 driver has got the steering wheel turned about 10 degrees to the right whereas um, in the Hyundai I've got the steering wheel turned more than 90 degrees to the left already beginning to uh, counteract and that's the thing about oversteer you've just got to be so quick and so accurate with that steering if you leave it more than a nanosecond that yaw starts to build up and it's too late early corrections is what it's all about now although the 86 spun it's actually good driving by the 86 driver and the reason is because quite a lot of steering lock was put on and the brakes were applied nice and early so the car never actually uh, left the track as opposed to the previous clip with the Pulsar where there was just really no steering lock applied and no brakes were applied and the car just ran off the track heading for disaster so good work from the 86 driver. Okay now we're well into the rotation now in the case of the 86 it's probably too far because um, it's basically now, now lost and the driver has had the nows to just slam the brakes on which is great. I've um, got 270 degrees of steering lock, lock, lock there which is good. Now with the Hyundai this is actually at full lock you only do 360 degrees worth of turn um, steering lock turn in a Hyundai so we've got full lock here and the car is now traveling sideways. It being a front drive car I can apply apply the power to help me out of oversteer. I didn't do that because I wasn't I didn't really want to run off the road and I felt that 360 degrees of steering lock um, was going to be enough and, and that turned out to be the case. Now if you want to learn how to do oversteer recovery here's the key skills you need. One you need to recognize it so you need to have this instinctive feel for it where you've actually made the correction before you've even realized consciously what it is and you're only going to get that by practice going drifting, skid pans, whatever else there. You're not going to get that just by trundling around at a racetrack at, at, at eight temps. You've got to be in a situation where you can push the car um, and the way to do it is rather than just continually initiate drift, just go faster and faster and faster till the car naturally starts to oversteer so you're kind of not expecting it. You won't build up the skills as much if you're always coming up to a corner and just putting a boot full of power that will help initially but to really develop it it's you've got to be able to recognize the inadvertent oversteers um, then you need vision this is the key thing just with anything to do with driving particularly on racetracks look well ahead and look where you need the car to go you're only going to build that skill up um, really by by practice and a lot of practice um, you then need to do steering because even if you do all of this if you can't quickly get the steering lock all the way that way and all the way that way accurately every time then it's all for naught and again see my steering video for rotational otherwise known as fixed input steering how to do that. And then pedals, you've got to know what to do with the pedals and the basic rule there is fix the um, foot first. So if, you're in a, if oversteer is caused by braking, reduce braking. If it's caused by power, reduce power. But how much do you reduce it by? It's generally not a snapping off. Um, it's often more of an easing off here and there depending on how far. Uh, it, so many different variables. Practice is what it, it's got to come down to and understanding what's going on. And then around all of that, is understanding the car dynamics which is what I've explained in this video there what is the circular traction what's happening there if you don't understand that theory then it's going to be you're going to be at a disadvantage when you're going to try all of these practical skills now the only way you're going to be able to reliably detect and then correct oversteer instinctively is to learn it and to do a lot of practicing. Now you can start that with pretty much any rear drive or possibly an all-wheel drive vehicle on a wet skid pan um, or you can go to uh, one of something like Rally School and rent a uh, rally car or you can just get yourself a rear-wheel drive car and start doing some dirty vents like auto carners or motor carners but you must put in a lot of practice. The big tip is to only accelerate when you're unwinding steering lock, which is the circle of traction theory. You are reducing the turning demand so you have more grip for acceleration. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, please like, subscribe, share, etc. Any questions, drop them in the comments. Thanks. Bye.